I first met Obinuju Ekiocha, or Uju, as she is known, in the spring of 2013. Uh, this was several months after she had written an open letter to Melinda Gates of the very powerful Gates Foundation. In her letter, Uju condemned this very wealthy woman, Melinda Gates, for donating millions of dollars to so-called reproductive health care in the world's poorest countries, many of which are in sub-Saharan Africa, which is where Uju comes from. Uju wrote a passionate response to Melinda Gates, describing the deep, natural, pro-life spirit of the African people. It was based on her own experience of growing up in her native Nigeria. Uju's letter went viral, and it launched her into the pro-life world, which she has been taking by storm ever since. People listen to Uju because she speaks the truth. She speaks the truth with passion, and she speaks the truth with authority about the way in which Africa is being corrupted and targeted by Western ideologies and practices. And she can speak so powerfully about Africa because she is African. Uju is the voice that the pro-life movement really had been waiting for. And she is a voice that SPUC has been privileged to hear in previous occasions at our events. And we are deeply privileged again. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Obianuju Ekiocha. I should smile a bit more. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be here. I was just thinking, when I looked up and saw that picture of me on the screen, I thought, oh my goodness, that's my picture from like seven years ago. <laughs> but that also kind of shows one thing that uh, I, I mean, just as Antonia had alluded to, I have been speaking at, at spot conferences, almost every national conference since then. And uh, I have quite enjoyed myself and I've made a lot of friends. And, you know, when I came here, I just helped so many people. Um, but um, for those people who don't want me to keep coming back, you're going to have to do a petition <laughs> to Spark to stop inviting me for events. I think that's what it would take uh, for that to happen. But it's a real pleasure to be here and to, to, to be given once again the opportunity um, to bring the African perspective, which I know most people don't get a chance to, uh, to hear. Uh, except again when they hear me or, or someone who is speaking from my point of view. So uh, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> so today I'll be speaking on abortion, population control, and the West's ideological neocolonialism in the 21st century. I know it's a mouthful. I know it's after lunch and people are feeling sleepy. <laughs> but do me a favor, don't sleep. Why? Because my two brothers are here and they have to tell my parents that I'm not boring. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, now, I'll just start with something I call my full disclosure. Every time I go out and I speak about African culture, African culture of life, you know, what is going on in Africa, when I speak in, uh, in places where I have a hostile audience or a mixed audience, um, sometimes people always come to me to pick a fight and they say Africa is not a country. It's a continent, I know, because I'm African, okay? So my full disclosure is this, all right? This is my own housekeeping. I do know that Africa is a continent and not a country with 55 countries. It used to be 54, but for the last few years now, we've had, we've had South Sudan, which itself is a, one of the newest countries in the world. So it's 55 countries now. It's a home to about 1 billion people or even a little bit more. Um, we have almost 3,000 native languages spoken across the continent. There are thousands of tribes. I am from the Igbo tribe myself. We have thousands of tribes and ethnic groups. Um, across the continent, there are many creeds that are professed. So therefore, there is really not one African culture. And I, I know that, all right? But I'll still keep talking about it as one Africa, okay? Because there, is, there are actually a, a common threads 
across the various African cultures and customs. Okay, so this is my full disclosure. I know that this is a very friendly audience, so no one will pick a fight with me, but I do like to start with this page as well so that people would know that and, and also get a bit of appreciation for just the, um, the real diversity that, is, that, that has become the continent of Africa. Now, we have heard uh, some statements in the last couple of years, and I mean, it's getting even louder, bolder, okay? We've had statements like this one. So African women are having seven or eight children per women. So this was said by President Emmanuel Macron last year at uh, some G something event, the G20 or G7, G, it's G something. So he said it. <laughs> and of course, there's a lot of opera and people were talking about it. And, you know, it, it was um, uh, people actually reacted to that. But we heard this, which is a very condescending statement by the president of France. Uh, we also, a few years ago, had uh, Sir... David Attenborough, which is, he's yours, right? He's a well-known uh, presenter here in the UK, but also internationally is very much respected. And he implied that famines uh, in Ethiopia were the result of many people, you know, was due to many people for too little land. And he did this, he actually made this statement uh, in an article that was entitled, Humans, a Plague on Earth. Plague on Earth, all right? Because I think it was a telegraph. Now, we heard from Bill Gates in a podcast, again, I think it was sometime last year, uh, that one of the biggest problems in the world, although that the world is facing now, is the rapid population growth in Africa. So we've heard these statements, and we've been bombarded by statements like this, by the high and mighty, the elites, the rich, the presidents and leaders of countries um, and organizations. So... It's all over the place. So I go back to my full disclosure page. That is the one thing that actually interests every, every one of these people. They, you know, they talk about Africa, but I think what, what they are all concentrating on is the fact that Africa is a home to one billion people. Oh my goodness. Like they don't care about anything else. I, well, I don't think so. But the fact that there is one billion people in Africa is giving them a headache. So, when our donors come in and they're presenting us with these beautiful sweeties and chocolates, you know what I'm talking about, it's the dollars, the euros, and the pounds. Who are these people? They are nations, they are organizations, and they are private foundations. The truth of the matter is that it's not more like the chocolate, it's more like that. When they come into African countries with all that money, they are more like gods. They hold the key to everything. And you find most times our African leaders are prostrated before that money and will do almost anything in order for them to get access to the funding. So... When they give us money, most of the foreign aid, well, a lot of the foreign aid, falls under this category of social sector foreign aid. I am sorry if you've heard me talk about this before, but I do have to explain a bit of this as a background to the next thing I'm going to talk about. So the se social sector foreign aid is what most people who think about aid will we'll think aid is. I mean, obviously, aid includes loans and all kinds of things and money to the military, but when you, in your mind, you, you think about the word foreign, you know, you think about the concept of foreign aid or humanitarian aid, you are thinking, okay, that's money going to poorer countries for education, for healthcare, for water supply and sanitation, for government and civil society and things like that. This is all true. This is all classed as social sector foreign aid. But in the last couple of years, this one has also become a part of social sector foreign aid. So that's money that is pushed into the area of population and reproductive health. Now, this, all of this information I've got from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, again, another mouthful, but it's a real organization, and you can always check their website to know exactly 
what it is that they do and what kind of information that they collate. Now, again, many people who have heard me talk, which is all of you, uh, must have seen this graph, which I also picked from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is exactly how that money has been allocated in the, uh, well, over a period of 17 years. So from 1996 to 2013. So you can see education is the red, uh, I mean, education is the purple. Healthcare is the yellow, if you, if you can't see it. I mean, it's right there in the middle. But then look at the red. The red is all the money that is being pumped into population and reproductive health. And notice that by 1996, when the, this particular data, the, the time period that this particular data covers, in 1996, it was actually the lowest fund that was being uh, given. And then it rose and rose and rose and everything else starts to come down, especially around 2007, 2008 during the recession in most of the Western countries. But the only thing that they didn't reduce was really population money. So it kept going up to the point that as of 2013, it was actually the highest um, money allocated from every Western donor to Africa. So this particular information is not just for the developing world, it's just about Africa, all right? So bear that in mind, and you wonder what exactly does it mean if it's like a hundred pounds, a thousand pounds, but how much is it that has been increasing? In 1993, the money being put into the area of population and reproductive health uh, for all of the developing countries was about $610 million. By 2012, that money came up to 12.4 billion with a B dollars. For those who can do the math, this is an increase of 1,932%. This is more than inflation. Hmm? <laughs> this one is not inflation. This is something else in action. This is ideology in action. And if you wonder what happened between 93 and 2012, what I believe is that uh, when the Cairo conference was held, uh, which was mostly, of course, about population, but it was, it was hosted by the United Nations Population Fund, so it was about population control, it was about abortion and all of these things. In 94, something happened at the Cairo conference. And just for the sake of information, this is 25 years later, and the United Nations wants to do a big plus five for the ICPD that happened in Cairo, and they have also decided to come back to Africa, and they are doing it in Kenya. And they are calling it the Kenya Summit of 2019, and unfortunately, the Kenyan government is cooperating with the United Nations, but they don't realize that in Cairo, that was where the decision was made that population programs should be given much more priority even than issues like education. So since, uh, in the well, in the last 20 years, about a hundred million, a hundred billion uh, dollars has been put into this particular issue. It's very hard to track. I've tried to make the calculations. Uh, once I hit a hundred million, a hundred billion dollars, I just gave up because it's a lot and it's very, they made it very complex and very difficult to track. And about 70% of all of that is going to my continent, Africa. So that's from the United Nations Population Fund. That's where I got this information from. Now, let's talk about fertility trends. You saw those, those uh, uh, comments that I had put up. And it's more than, much more than that. It's not just those three comments. It's people saying, Africa, they're having too many babies. And in, in one's mind, you probably are thinking that too. Um, you may not mind it, but most people do mind it. So I thought, let's bring the facts to light. Let people actually see what is going on in reality according to the data. So here is a graph of the fertility trends. Uh, Africa, that's sub-Saharan Africa, which is a part of Africa, of course, where a lot of these things, when they talk about it, they mean the sub-Saharan African countries. So that's like the 40, I think it's like the 42 countries uh, that would not include the northern part of Africa. 
the black people, in fact. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so uh, you have below the, all the other lines, if you can't see it, it's like South Asia, Middle East, and North Africa put together, the world, uh, Latin America. But Sub-Saharan Africa is the one at the top. But if, you, if you're someone that usually looks at graphs, I mean, this is from 1960 to 2011, so it's fairly uh, recent. It's like the last half a century, I'd say. If you look at that, actually the fertility is falling in Africa. The data shows very clearly that yes, we are also having a fertility decline. In a period of 35 years, we've had a 25% fertility decline. And this is data, and even anecdotally, I can tell you that a lot of people who are my age mates uh, in Nigeria and other places, they usually do not, are not having as many children as their parents. So yes, there is a fertility decline that is happening. But the problem is that the, the fertility decline of Sub-Saharan Africa is about half the rate of everywhere else. You can see how sharp the decline is for other people. And we are having half the decline rate. And this is where they're all going crazy. All the people who want us today to be, you know, to have contraception thrown in our water, into our, you know, into our school water supplies and everything, let, let Africa just, just stop having children. The problem they're having is really that we're not um, depopulating ourselves. We are, we are not at the point where other people are. Instead of them to be concerned that you see all the, the cluster of, of a, regions, I would say, are actually below, most of them are actually below replacement rate. That's where the worry should be. But no, they will concentrate on Africa. So that's the fact. So this here is another fact for you that many people do not actually realize. That's the African continent. And it's very easy to get access to this information that the population density of Africa is 36.4 people per kilometer square. Because as most people probably will know, what is most important is not really how many people are in a country, it's how many people who are in a particular square, uh, square kilometer. That's actually how you know, is, the, is this room overpopulated, right? So it's 36.4 people per kilometer square. Oh my goodness, overpopulation, overpopulation in Africa. Okay, so let, let's, let's look at Europe. Let's, let's see Europe because I live in Europe and I've lived in Africa. Okay. Seventy two point nine kil people per kilometer square. Ah, that's okay. Have you been to Derby is so nice. <laughs> Do you feel it's overpopulated in Derby? No, everything is so nice. So definitely Africa is having half the population density of Europe, at least at the moment. Yes, they are projecting that in the next 50 years, okay, every one in, I don't know, one in four people will be Africans. But then for now, and for many, many decades now, we have been much less, we've had a much less population density than Europe. So again, let's look at the true size of Africa. Remember when I told you that there's one billion people in Africa? And yeah, that kind of sounds a lot, right? It's like seven billion people, I think, in the, in the world, or even more than one billion. Okay, so let's, let's see. So in 2010, the Economist published a map that uh, really surprised everybody and a lot of people who talked about it at the time. It was in, the, if you want to track it down, it's the November edition of The Economist. And it was this guy who had uh, put the map together. His name is Kai Kraus. And this was what he came up with. So he brought out the Africa, the real size of Africa by landmass. And of course the landmass of all the other countries and started to fit them in the countries or the regions into the African continent. And this is exactly, because I know that's a little bit hard to see, but don't worry, 
I will tell you what everything, everybody who fit into the African continent. The United States, of course, fit into the, like the Western region, the West African region. With its 300,000 people, the United States, 300 million people, sorry. And you have all of Eastern Europe fit in very nicely and comfortably. Much of Western Europe, all of China with its one billion people, all of India with its one billion people, all of Japan. So really, already I can count probably almost three billion people that could comfortably fit into the African continent for, for us to even be uh, comparable to other continents. And yet, they are giving us contraception like you give children candies. Now, the false narrative that, are, that people trade in about population and overpopulation in Africa is that every time they try to talk about population in Africa, you see a picture like this. It's, oh my goodness, thousands and thousands of people trying to, I don't know what it is they're doing there, but I actually think it, it looks like one of our political rallies. <laughs> so they just come in and take a picture and then they go to the United Nations and say, see, it's just these Africans that's just squashed into this, oh. okay. I'm from Nigeria. It's the most populous country in Africa. Um, and we have that reputation for being the most popular. So I decided, okay, I'll start, from, I'll start from Nigeria. Let me show you what I found out about population in my country and why it is that when the pictures are taken, it, it looks bad like this one, all right? So that is my country with uh, the colors representing population densities of the states. There are 36 states in, my, in Nigeria. The problem we have, it's not that we're overpopulated. It is that there is so much problems in the way that our nations are run in terms of corruption and lack of transparency that we don't have as many places where one can comfortably live as say you have here. So here in the UK, you can live in Manchester, you can live in Derby, you can live in small neighborhoods or villages or, or suburbs. It doesn't matter. You will still have access to clean drinking water. You have access to electricity. Your children can go to school, you know, but it's not exactly like that in Nigeria. So everyone is trying to live in about 11 states. Like they're running to 11 states, even though they are originally from, you know, these other, you know, other states. So the most populous place is Lagos State, which is the tiny purple bit at the bottom there. Right? Lagos State is the smallest state in Nigeria with the tiniest land mass. I think it's something like less than 1% of our land mass is Lagos, but that is our commercial center that you have thousands and thousands of schools, thousands of hospitals, thousands of, you know, you know it, well, it's not all that good, but it's better than any other part of the country more business uh, opportunities. So people are running to Lagos. In fact, I have uh, seen data that shows that one in nine Nigerians live in this 1% landmass. So you can imagine that when you come into Lagos, you feel that there is no more space. Oh my goodness, these Africans are gonna kill themselves with giving birth to, no. It's that everybody has run from the north and from the parts of the east, they're running to this purple patch and they all want to leave there because that's where all the opportunities are. And then there's other regions as well, the Port Harcourt and where we come from, like um, the Igbo land and we have like Onicha, everybody tries to leave there. Now look at all those green places. Those are places with low population density. Now the dark green states are the ones with underpopulation. So nobody wants to live in Niger. I mean, people are going away from Niger and going to live in Abuja or they're going to live in other parts of the country. And this is exactly what you see in other African countries. In Uganda, everyone tries to run to live in Kampala. So the, the population density is so much. And that is not um, to say that the country is overpopulated is that the, the way of settlement 
is, is terrible. And it's because the governments are not doing the right thing and most places are not habitable enough that young people want to stay there when they graduate. Everybody would run to the capital, everyone would run to the other cities. So there's only a few cities in each African country that everybody would want to live in. And that's the problem that Africa is having. So Nigeria, just like Kai Krause has done, I thought I should check the landmass and try to fit people into Nigeria, just to show you the size of the country. So Nigeria can easily take all of the United Kingdom, as well as Germany, as well as Italy, and the Netherlands. So combined, we are a big country. We, are, we have the landmass. It's just a really terrible settlement, and there's a lot of corruption, and there's lack of transparency, and people are just not um, getting the standard of living that is required. So yes, Melinda Gates would then see the pictures from Lagos, and they would want to push policy for funding based on what they are seeing in the pictures. I think, it's a, I think that's wrong, and I think that's even like a scandal. So there are other factors that nobody is considering when they, when they give us these numbers of population. It's the, the fact that we are also like a very, you know, we're migrating because people are constantly looking for um, easier ways of life and more opportunities. There's also a lot of internal migration, as I had shown you. There's Lagos, and then everybody's trying to move there, and everybody's trying to move to Port Harcourt, and people are going to Abuja. The debt rates are very high, and when they try to... Uh, you know, throw all their condoms and contraception at us. They're not even asking what the death rate is and what the life expectancy is. There's infant mortality. There's, um, yeah, of course, the life expectancy, as I mentioned. So it is really, um, a, a, this is the kind of subject that when they are discussing it on international stage, they're not asking for these opinions because this will actually contradict a lot of the things that they are pushing and a lot of things that they are saying. So, oh, we've gone back to the social sector foreign aid. <laughs> so sorry. Let's see. Oh, what? Am I going back? Like oh my goodness. <laughs> Why am I having to go back through these? No way. <laughs> no. What's going on? John? <laughs> Was this meant to happen to me? No way. Okay. So you're going to have to learn it twice. The next thing that follows is an exam. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about abortion in Africa. This is uh, the donors. This has become the donors obsession because of course there's one thing population. Some of them are talking about it, but the one that they really harp on about is abortion. And this notion that many of the African nations have refused to legalize abortion. So it's a real headache for them. And they're having to move through a lot of obstacles uh, to see how they can get abortion legalized. I, I quite enjoyed the uh, fantastic speech that we heard this morning from uh, Sir Jeffrey and what's going on in Northern Ireland. And to a large extent, that's actually the kind of thing that is going on in Africa, between Africa and the international world. It's these people who have abortion, who have legalized abortion and who have been uh, aborting their babies over the years have now really taken interest in the fact that Africans have refused to kill their own children. So that has become an obsession. So they frame it as the safe abortion initiatives or this idea or notion of safe abortion, bringing safe abortion to the African woman. Um, and you see things like this, right? This was the first one that I tracked down, the Safe Abortion Action Fund, which is, um, or was, because I think it's come to an end now for a couple of years, uh, a funding stream, so a huge funding pocket where various Western countries came together and put money into that pocket. And then they went out to developing countries, especially African countries, to uh, use the money from the Western nations to promote abortion. And this is the 
uh, from their website or their manual. And as you can see, um, it says here, well, in front, if you, if you know the organization IPPF, that's International Planned Parenthood Federation. But it, it, they were organizing it, but they didn't own it. They weren't the, the money wasn't there. So they'll get the, from the British government, they'll get from the Dutch government, uh, and some other governments as well, especially in Europe, and put into this pocket and use it to push for abortion. And of course, as you can see, there's a black woman in front of that thing. So it just feels like, oh yeah, black people, Africans, they want abortion. No, it's actually IPPF that wants abortion for us. And the Western nations are going along with it. So after the SAF, the Safe Abortion Action Fund, came this one that was actually started only two years ago. Uh, it's called the She Decides Campaign. So the She Decides Campaign was actually a response more to Trump than anything else. So President Trump had taken out uh, or defunded uh, International Planned Parenthood Federation and Marriage Service International and some of these abortion organizations that are pushing for uh, abortions in the developing world. So the US uh, president took it away. And then this woman in, in the Netherlands, um, uh, who was a minister at the time, she's no longer a minister, Liliana Plumen, she decided, she decided, she decided that African women should have an, uh, an, a safe abortion initiative, and she called it She Decides. So who's she? Is it Liliana Plumen, who is from the Netherlands, or is it Uju from Nigeria? Right, so she actually decided that we should have this, and they came together and they, they did a fundraising uh, thing that a party out in Belgium, and they raised about a hundred and more than 180 million euros just on the day, and that's to show you the and how enthusiastic these uh, Western donors are about getting abortion into Africa. So this again. The, the same strategy, as you can see, this is directly from their website. As you can see, they're all black uh, girls who are there in the picture. They're not asking for abortion, obviously, but then they've used their picture now uh, to, to promote this particular initiative. So it's as if they are asking uh, for, for this abortion. So it's a, you know, I call it a donor's will versus the recipient's way. There is the donor's will, which is very obvious to see. You see where the money is going. You think about that graph for the population and reproductive health uh, funding that is going way up. That is the donor's will. And their will, they show it through how and where they put their money. But this is the donor's, uh, the recipient's uh, will, or the recipient's way. This is what we find when we go to African countries. This picture, I'm sure some of you may have seen it, but I, it was taken in Sierra Leone a few years ago when abortion was being pushed uh, through the parliament. Again, this was something that the politicians themselves had decided. It was a private member's bill. It read very much like the one, like the Abortion Act of 67, that it was even a private bill in an African parliament. It's not very common. So you can see that this was something that was very much packaged by lobbyists that came from the West to show the technique that has been used in the past by Western uh, abortion activists. And they're using it, they're trying it out in African countries. So they pushed it in Sierra Leone and, and the abortion bill, the safe abortion bill was passed um, almost unanimously in the parliament. It went to the, uh, to the president's desk and President Korma was about to sign it when the religious leaders paid him a visit. And they said to him, if you sign this, we will tell everybody not to vote for you. Like it was, <laughs> it was a straight up, uh, instruction that the religious leaders, the inter-religious council gave to the president, and he pushed it away from his desk, and he said, I wouldn't sign it, even though the first lady, his wife at the time, was very much in support of this abortion bill, he could not sign it because the religious leaders of the country showed him that, in fact, they had more political will and more power than the president. And guess what? This bill was passed in December, of 2015 up to today that I'm speaking here, I think this is 14th of September, 2019, there is no legal abortion in Sierra Leone. <laughs> so that is the recipient's way. 
So when I went out there, had some uh, town halls across the country. The, uh, the Catholic bishops were very gracious to me that they uh, gave me an opportunity to speak in the different parts of the country because there was no conference organized, but they organized town halls in the different cathedrals. And I went around the country, 700 kilometers, talking to people. And every time I'm about to get to a place, I'm, I'm trying to psych up myself and thinking, what will I tell these people to make them pro-life? But when I get there, I realize they're all like, Pro-life, if they, they don't need me to tell them how to be pro-life, they just want their voices heard. So these women were demonstrating and saying that they don't want an abortion. You can see she made, this lady made her sign in the house and she said, we don't need any safe, any safe abortion as nothing is safe in killing. So we say no to abortion. This is, these are the signs, the signs that women made, homemade signs that women made in their homes. And I always say this when I bring up this picture that you will know that I didn't tell this woman to write this. I didn't instruct her. I wasn't advising her to write it. They came with these signs. How do you know that? Because nothing is spelled wrong. <laughs> And I would have spelled it correctly. So, but these women are like, you know, women who are traders and, and petty traders and all of that. They decided they don't want abortion. And they, they were saying it. All they needed was just for the world to hear their voices. So the one on the left, this picture is about what money, the donor's money can buy. The other one is the will of the African people. All right, so let's, uh, you know, yes, people say to me, anecdote, anecdote. You know, I talk about my travels in Africa. Yeah, I've gone to Sierra Leone, I've seen pro-life people. I've gone to Ghana, seen pro-life people, and, you know, Malawi, wherever. However, that is not proof, Uju. That's not in the, uh, the United Nations that tell us it's not evidence-based. So I love to give them some evidence-based because I do a lot of reading myself and I look for data and I love data because I love to show the numbers and show that when they bother to even count the numbers, they find that uh, everything, that Africa is indeed pro-life. So here was a poll that was, uh, that was conducted by Pew Research which is not a pro-life, you know, which is not pro-life by any stretch of imagination. They did this in 2013, 2014, I think it was. They went through 40 different countries, including African countries and non-African countries. And they were asking people about various moral issues. And this was how people talked about abortion. So they went through a number of African countries asking them uh, whether they think abortion is, is abortion morally acceptable to you or not. And in South Africa, where they have had legal abortion, by the way, since, oh, since the 90s, I think it was 1997, unfortunately, President Mandela, for all the good he did, he actually brought abortion to his people, which is very sad, very unfortunate. But he passed an, one of the most liberal abortion uh, laws ever, okay? And we have that in Africa. We have that in South Africa. So they've had that for over 20 years. Um, and even 61% of the population answered in this particular survey that abortion was morally unacceptable to them. Uh, in Nigeria, my country, 80% of the people who were questioned uh, in this particular uh, poll. Uh, oh, and Kenya. Kenya was 82%, Uganda 88%, and I think it's Ghana that was 92%. And you can see just how pro-life uh, the, the people are in different African countries. So for somebody to actually get uh, abortion legalized, it either has to be by stealth, you have to trick the people, it has to be just the politicians talking among themselves and deciding against the will of the people. But every time it happens, they have to do it in secret. And, uh, but they know also that for supporting abortion, you will actually not have a political career much for much longer. So my own uh, state governor at one point in time had tried to pass an abortion, a terrible bill that was really an abortion bill. It was meant to be an anti-violence bill, but somewhere within it was the worst, violent, worst violence ever, which was abortion. Uh, and then this was exposed uh, by people within my home archdiocese, the archdiocese of Oweri, and my archbishop, Archbishop Obinna, who is an amazing, amazing uh, bishop, he uh, organized 
all the Catholics and the non-Catholics, they marched to the state house, they were against it, and for days the church was out there talking, complaining, women were crying, people had their signs, and they were telling the governor, we are going to continue protesting this up to the day of elections. So the governor quickly uh, removed that part of the bill and he made even public apologies to the people. That is how it happens in Africa. That's, that's the standard. That is the standard. So here, it's, this, is the, this, is hard, this is hard data and one cannot contest that. This, these are the numbers and the numbers don't lie. Okay, so... Um, here is what you would see even in some places is not just the fact that the people themselves are saying abortion is morally unacceptable. When you go right down to the laws and the constitutions of the different countries, you find that the, the child in the womb is protected. And in fact, two of those I, I particularly highlighted here because, um, oh, so this is, sorry, let, let's go through the legal abortion. I don't know who who knows exactly where abortion has been legalized? There are only four African countries that have abortion on demand. And even I think that's too much. Uh, it should be zero, okay? But South Africa, of course, has legal abortion and Tunisia and uh, Cape, a small country called Cape Verde and, and Mozambique that legalized abortion in 2014. And since then, nobody has been able to legalize abortion in any other country. Sierra Leone would have been the next one which came in 2015. And of course, by the grace of God, that was completely blocked and didn't go anywhere. Okay, so let's talk about the UK government and where your government stands and what the UK government is doing with your money and your taxes, okay? So the UK government's foreign policy on funding abortions overseas is all found in this manual that I think the first time was published in 2011. It has since then been updated, but it still says pretty much the same thing. And this is exactly what the UK government has said they will fund. They will fund abortion organizations overseas. They said they will fund abortion services. So if you think about it in countries, in those countries like Sierra Leone, where women are saying, we're saying no to abortion because we care so much and we believe that our children are our children, even from the womb, the UK government says they are able to go in and kill people's children while they are in the womb. The UK government has also said they don't have any problems with their funding going into advocacy in countries where there are local groups asking for legalized abortion. So in other words, what the UK government is saying is that they are ready for their money to be used to lobby, and in some cases by politicians in countries that are already corrupt. Okay, so I have spoken to politicians in African countries and I tell you something, your money does go in some very strange places and to some very corrupt uh, um, uh, causes, all right? And abortion is certainly one of them. And it's, of course, killing Africa's unborn children. So that's, that's the official stance. And you should actually read that. It would be good if you, it's, it's, on, it, it's actually on, I think it's on the DFID website, but you can easily find it online. It's a PDF uh, document, so it's very easy to read and keep and even post to others so that you can see exactly where your country stands on funding abortions overseas. So now I want to talk about Marie Stokes International and the UK government and the very unholy alliance between the government and this particular organization. Everybody who knows me and knows my work knows me that knows me for one thing, that I have been chasing after Marie Stobes for many years. <laughs> and I have investigated them. I've investigated them in, in all the African countries wherever I've gone, and I've heard really terrible things about some of their practices. I can tell you something, this British organization is causing more havoc 
Um, but it's, it's actually worse because they're causing havoc in your name. And I'll tell you why, because even though it's, it's obviously it's not a government organization, but here is what the British government does with them. So the, under the, each year they release their annual reports and you can easily see the, how much they are giving to, how much they, they get, they get as, as grant income, what they call their, their grant income. So that's what they get from the Department for International Development, which of course is British, British government. And of course it's the British people and your taxes. So in 2011, they got 11 million, 11, uh, 13.3 million pounds. In 2012, the next year, they got 21, so that was a huge jump. In 2013, they got 27.5 million from your government. In 2014, they got 45.3 million pounds for, your, for their work in Africa and other places. In 2015, 46.4 million. 2016, 46.5 million. 2017, 44.4 million. So that was a little bit of a decrease. And I'll show you what happened in the interim. But of course, that was very quickly rectified by someone because by 2018, they got more than they had ever got from the British government, which was 48.17 million pounds. Let this sink in. Marie Stokes International is an abortion organization. They don't hide it. They don't, they don't try to, you know, cover what they do. It's an abortion organization. So in African countries, they are doing abortions legally and illegally. They are lobbying governments. And they are also, of course, very much involved in the whole population control thing. This is a picture that I got. Well, this is like a screenshot from my documentary, Strings Attached, if you haven't watched it, well, we're gonna have to correct that. I told Catherine Hampton today that uh, you, anybody from any Spock branch can organize, if you want to organize a screening of Strings Attached, which is very much about, about Marie Stokes International, it's, it's, you just get in touch with Catherine Hampton and she'll organize that for you. Okay, so this is a child. This girl is definitely a minor. And this happened in Kenya. And they're sterilizing her. All right, so. Okay, so we do have to. Okay, this is what happened in 2018. 2018, um, uh, Theresa May went out to Africa. I think this was in Kenya where she was giving a statement and she was making a speech. And of course, while she was there, she made a promise in the name of the British government that the UK government was going to give Marie Stokes International 200 million. No, she just said 200 million was going to be used to uh, promote birth control in African countries. So a few weeks later, that then was that came up on, on the parliament floor and, and there was a question asked by, I think it was Lord Alton, and we found out that of the 200 million that uh, she was given, uh, the prime minister at the time was given, 77 million was going to Marie Stubbs International. Okay, the remaining 135 million was going to Planned Parenthood. So really, what she gave was money to, uh, to abortion organizations. That's, that was very clear. So of all this money that is being given, this is, these are the people that your government is ignoring. It's the African women who are constantly, all the time, whenever they're given opportunities, saying they don't want abortion, they don't want abortion. And I have been in different African regions and it's the same thing all the time. All right, so again, I had mentioned some pro-life constitutions. Uganda has a very pro-life constitution that is acknowledging the unborn child in the womb and saying that abortion will not be allowed. Kenya also has something in their constitution saying that life begins at conception. So African nations are going even to the point of their constitutions to say that they will not allow abortion and they recognize that you know the child in the womb is alive, is a live human being and should be protected. And yet, all this money, millions and millions of pounds is being given to abortion organizations to come to African nations. So just in conclusion, I know that I've spoken a lot about Africa, but just to show you also that in the UK, this is not something that is affecting only 
Africa, in the UK, abortion is also affecting black communities, all right? So uh, the data shows that about 8% of all abortion that is done in this country is being done uh, of, on black and on black and, and uh, black and black British women sounds little, eight percent, but we actually only make up three point four percent of the country's population. So again, they are aborting more black babies, just like they're doing in America. Okay, so and then we're having almost like serial abortions within black communities. And anybody hear this story this summer where the judge said that a disabled woman must abort her baby? That was terrible, okay? So that, I put it here because that woman was actually Nigerian or she was of Nigerian descent. So again, abortion, of course, is racist, all right? Of everything they tell you that they love black people and everything, abortion is actually quite racist. So you tell it to them that abortion is racist and is affecting black people. And those who pray outside abortion clinics know that most, a lot of the people who are actually walking in there, who are in trouble, who are in need, uh, it's black women and women from other ethnic minority groups. So please speak up and do not stop what you are doing because you're already doing amazing work and you are saving lives. And a lot of the lives you're saving are even lives of people who are immigrants in this country, who are people in need, who are people who are desperate. So I thank you for the work you are doing. Continue to do it and beyond everything, even whether abortion is killing black children or white children, doesn't matter. Abortion is actually the most uh, horrific human rights abuse of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Uju. I can't see there being a petition anytime soon to stop you coming back. Um, we've probably got time for two very quick questions, but if you can keep them one sentence here at the front. Thank you very much for your very inspiring and evidence-based talk. What I'd like to ask is that you have shown how direct action can be effective in African states in getting your leaders to change their minds. Do you think that is what we should be doing here? Should we be telling our politicians, if you don't do what we want, we won't vote for you, just full stop? Not a lot of sort of clever talk. Well, absolutely, you do need, you do need that. And I think uh, Sir Jeffrey had also mentioned that in the morning, is to, it's to get people motivated, but you have, you need a lot more people. I think the pro-life movement, uh, the ones who come up and show up for things, it's not enough to affect uh, the political outcomes, if you like, unlike Nigeria, where it's like 80%, right? But you who are here then have to go out and win a lot more people. We need a lot more action going on. We need to win people in universities. We need to win people in, you know, in, in who are just in professional life. You get people, and of course, yes, you approach your uh, people who are in politics, and make them realize that it, this, this issue is so important to you that you are ready to vote for, for it or about it. Yeah. With uh, foundations like Mary Stopes and Planned Parenthood funding abortion in African countries where it is illegal, how are they being, well, they're not, are they, but why aren't they being made accountable and who would they be accountable to? By breaking the law. Yes. So, of course, one thing that may have you may have heard me say in this talk is how much corruption there is in a lot of places. If a, if an organization comes in with forty million pounds and they get more than that, I mean, the forty something million pounds is only coming from the British government. Think about what other governments are giving them. They get about 150 million pounds, I think, from, from just as grant income. They come in and they are so powerful. Um, Marie Stopes leaders and directors have access to our health ministries, our you know, people within the cabinets of the presidents of the various countries. They go to meetings at the African Union. They are able to lobby directly. So there's corruption and they have access. However, uh, in some African countries, there have already now been cases where the grassroots, they have been investigated by people, and people have just come, you know, just 
completely um, uh, been outraged by what has happened. So I'll give you an example in Kenya, I think two, two summers ago, two years ago, uh, Marie Stokes International went into a secondary school and said they were giving some uh, sex education talk and ended up giving contraception to the girls, the underage girls in, the, in, the, in that particular school. And the parents were so outraged that in the Kenyan news, I mean, this was all over the papers in, in Kenya, the local papers, they wanted to see an arrest made. They were saying, you know, not only do we want Marie Stokes shut down, we just want to see who you have arrested for this particular crime. Because to them, it was a crime to go and have access to their daughters and, and give them contraception and all whatnot. So... There are countries where they've already gotten into trouble in Nigeria a couple of months ago. They were also, they had like a huge shutdown in their Lagos branch. Um, Niger Republic has also shut down, suspended them or shut them down. They've had, I think it was in, in Tanzania where they were, they had some problems, uh, Zambia where they had problems and the government also suspended them. So they keep running into problems. And of course, if you watch Strings Attached, if you watch Strings Attached, my documentary, <laughs> you will also learn um, more things that have happened and how close they've come each time to being um, completely shut out. So this particular problem, I think it has two ends to it. I want to see the Africans rise up against what Maristops is doing, which in some cases they are doing effectively. Uh, but also I want to see the British government completely defund them. I say this organization has so much scandal, they should not get any money, any taxpayers' money. So you guys can stop Marie Stokes in doing what they are doing in Africa if you are asking for them to completely get defunded. Today, but everything is in my book and the address I went this outside. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um, well, we, we're over time already. Uju's here for a few minutes after if you want to speak to her. And she said everything else is in her book. Okay. <laughs>